The World Economic Forum, or ODEF, is an international non-government organization, but unlike influential bodies such as the INF, World Bank, or World Trade Organization, it lacks direct practical authority. Despite this, it annually draws some of the most influential figures in economics, policymaking, business, entertainment, religion, journalism, and politics to its summit held in Davos, a quaint skiing town in Switzerland. Given its absence of concrete international powers, it can be puzzling why such influential individuals make the effort to attend an event that has faced controversy since its beginning. The WEF itself hasn't done much to quell these controversies, and in some instances has exacerbated them. This is often due to their approach of promoting ideas that, while potentially agreeable, are presented in ways that are controversial, provocative, and counterproductive to the arguments they aim to convey. Unfortunately, this tendency means that discussions surrounding the true role of the World Economic Forum are frequently dominated by critics who perceive everything they do as inherently negative, painting Davos as little more than a gathering of supervillains plotting world domination. When a secretive organization brings together the world's most powerful figures in a remote mountain hideout to discuss crucial aspects of the global economy and uses terms like the Great Reset, it's no wonder people express genuine concerns about the organization's influence. Now, I realize I shouldn't start a video by saying this if I want you to stick around till the end, but the sober reality is often less captivating than lizard people and world domination. Still, in many ways, it might be even more concerning. To unravel why, let's address some key questions. How did the World Economic Forum evolve into the influential entity it is today? What is the organization's supposed role? And most importantly, what are the genuine issues with the World Economic Forum that tend to be overshadowed by more sensationalist conspiracies? The World Economic Forum is often grouped with other international organizations, such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, and even the United Nations. These are substantial entities that play crucial roles in global macroeconomic, geopolitical, and social issues, although not always in immediately discernible ways. Despite their similarities, these organizations conduct independent economic research, offer advice to policymakers, employ numerous economists, and operate as ostensibly impartial intermediaries between national governments. What sets the World Economic Forum apart is its origin governments didn't establish it, and it doesn't rely on government funding. For instance, the World Bank was formed by a delegation of 44 countries after the Second World War and now boasts 189 member countries, all contributing to the organization's funding through their national budgets to varying extents. While some less affluent member countries may contribute nothing, wealthier nations like the USA contribute significantly. This particular organization, the World Bank, allocates the funds it receives with the goal of providing loans to developing economies. The purpose is to enable these nations to invest in infrastructure and tools, fostering their integration as productive members of the global economy. The World Bank's explicit and public objective is to support developing economies in making strategic investments, while they also engage in activities such as collecting economic data much of which we use on this channel, particularly when discussing GDP figures, these efforts primarily serve to fulfill their primary mandate of providing funding to developing economies. The World Bank isn't overly concerned with whether we have reliable data for our economics explained leaderboard or not. In contrast, the World Economic Forum has a different origin story. Nations didn't create it and have a more modest beginning. Founded by Klaus Schwab, an engineer and business professor, it initially operated as the European Management Forum. Schwab secured a grant from the European Commission to organize a conference in Davos, inviting Western European business executives. The purpose was to expose them to different management practices employed by companies in the more economically successful USA. Initially, the annual conferences organized by the World Economic Forum were akin to the many mundane management seminars happening globally today. However, over time, 
These gatherings evolved, expanding their scope and guest list to encompass global macroeconomic concerns and the policymakers capable of translating them into reality. Many politicians and policymakers don't have an economic background. Instead, their expertise often lies in law. Consequently, they rely on economic advisors to understand the economic implications of their decisions and policies. Having a platform like the Davos Conference proves valuable, allowing decision makers to glean insights from economists worldwide about what has succeeded or failed in various countries. This exchange of knowledge is crucial in a world where technological and economic expertise is readily shared. For instance, while the UK took a century to fully industrialize, a country like South Korea achieved the same feat in just two decades. In theory, conferences like Davos can be a significant force for good, providing a platform for the sharing of technological and economic know-how. However, the true impact lies in how it operates in reality. It's worth noting that the World Economic Forum insists that its annual summit in Davos is not a conference, but rather a series of meetings between participants, although there's no discernible technical difference, so whatever. Beyond its flagship annual conference, the organization has expanded its activities significantly. It funds and publishes economic research, champions initiatives like its Trillion Tree campaign, and recognizes individuals with awards for their positive impact on the world. The funding for these events and other nonprofit operations doesn't come from governments, but mainly from businesses eager to participate in these discussions. Companies wishing to attend the Davos meeting and engage in the forum's activities are required to pay substantial membership fees, which can exceed $600,000 annually, in addition to individual admission costs. While the organization, despite being nonprofit, needs funding, this brings us to the first genuine problem with the World Economic Forum. The list of companies currently partnering with the BUEF is extensive, including a significant if not a majority share of major international corporations from every industry around the world. This presents a challenge for the World Economic Forum to genuinely fulfill its claim of being an intellectual community for the open exchange of ideas. While their annual meetings historically emphasize sustainable capitalism, environmentalism, renewable energy development, and social entrepreneurship, the extensive list of international companies paying to sustain the forum raises questions about its independence. Despite its assertion of independence, the WEF's continued operations heavily depend on financial support from these corporations. While it's a reality that even here at EE, on a much smaller scale, we need to consider the impact of sponsorships on our content. Taking money from a sponsor for a video means we must avoid discussing topics that could harm the sponsor's business, ensuring an unbiased analysis of the subjects we wish to cover. Therefore, when the World Economic Forum wants to host discussions about transitioning away from fossil fuels while being sponsored by major players in the fossil fuel industry like BP, Shell, and Aramco, it naturally raises an evident question about potential conflicts of interest. The support of major corporations, even when the World Economic Forum appears to advocate against their best interests, raises a critical question. Either the forum is not effective, rendering all the grand talk about making the world a better place as mere greenwashing, or there's another reason these companies find it worthwhile to be involved. Critics argue that initiatives discussed at the DOEF are challenging to take seriously due to the apparent hypocrisy among attendees. Discussions about a green economy or sustainable capitalism lose credibility when those with the power to influence change arrive in private jets, emitting significant carbon footprints. Despite being well-funded, the annual Davos Summit necessitates the Swiss government to spend millions of dollars each year on security. Even more concerning is the thought that if the topics discussed at Davos do influence real policy debates, potentially detrimental to the companies funding the forum, they still contribute because there might be a more significant reason to be involved, what transpires behind closed doors. Most of the discussions, Q, and a panels, and roundtables at Davos are available to watch online, offering valuable access to information at no cost. 
While this accessibility is beneficial, it raises a pertinent question. If the true allure of Davos is the open discussions and the free exchange of ideas, why pay exorbitant amounts when the same information is available for free online? The real reason companies invest heavily in attending Davos lies in the discussions not posted online. Most talks and panelists serve as marketable window dressing for the genuine attraction, a networking event for some of the most powerful people globally, a single lucrative deal struck with a world leader or another company executive could easily justify the hefty admission price. Not being involved means missing out on potential opportunities discussed at the event, which could be granted to competitors. Criticism towards the World Economic Forum and Davos meetings stems partly from the understandable resentment people feel towards an exclusive club to which they are not invited. This sentiment intensifies when the club discusses matters that could profoundly affect the way individuals lead their lives. This high level of exclusivity at Davos raises questions about the forum's purported mission to act as a platform for a diverse range of ideas. The steep barriers to having a voice at the event, along with the consistent attendance of a select group, has led Klaus Schwab himself to dub it the Davos family. Typically, the regular attendees form a tight-knit Davos community, all hailing from overwhelmingly privileged backgrounds and frequently sharing similar perspectives. The challenge with this exclusivity is that the same people, in the same location and from the same privileged backgrounds, are unlikely to offer the broadest ideas, opinions, or objectives, especially those that align with the concerns of regular people. While they could lower the barriers to entry, the forum is reluctant to do so, as its major partners are more interested in a place to lobby than a platform to address the challenges faced by working-class families. Over time, these concerns have transformed from a desire to understand the discussions at Davos to more extreme notions, ranging from suspicions about secret plots to taking over the world by so-called lizard people. The World Economic Forum could have taken steps to address these concerns, but it seems to have moved in the opposite direction, attempting to extinguish the conspiracy bonfire with gasoline. An illustrative example is their annual choice of a general theme that frames their meetings, with most presentations intended to link back to it. A notable focus in recent years was the concept of the Great Reset. In reality, the Great Reset was a thought experiment contemplating how the global economy could be reimagined and improved after the major shock of the global pandemic. Given the magnitude of the global disruption, it was similar to a reset to the system, offering an opportunity for participants to discuss innovative ideas that could yield real benefits. Implementing such changes, however, would be challenging during regular economic operations. Much like making significant modifications to a car, which is usually turned off for such work, an economy cannot be easily turned off. The uniqueness of the situation made it an opportune time for discussions. The World Economic Forum needs to keep its attendees engaged to maintain their interest and attendance, and it relies on the participation of influential figures to remain relevant. The concept of the Great Reset, introduced by the World Economic Forum, appears to have been more of a clickbait for the global elite than a substantive exploration of economic discussions. Rather than clearly explaining this, the BUEF chose to double down on a narrative that, without context, can sound extremely ominous. They released press materials featuring concepts like eating bugs and owning nothing, accompanied by an unelected world leader, which added to the alarm. Those behind and attending these events are undoubtedly intelligent, especially the politicians who have built their careers on understanding what resonates with the public. The Great Reset, however, seemed out of touch, sounding unappealing to regular people. The possibility is that they either underestimated how it would be received or felt untouchable and didn't care about public perception. In reality, Davos is a conference that has evolved into a key networking event where businesses and politicians can communicate directly outside official channels. It's not a secretive mountain lair where lizard people secretly plot to change the world. Instead, it's a highly publicized event that doesn't bother hiding its proceedings 
and at times, seems to play into the concerns people have about the actions of their elected and unelected leaders on that mountain every year. In conclusion, we've delved into the intricacies of the World Economic Forum and its annual Davos Summit. While the forum aims to be a platform for open discussions, there are valid concerns about its exclusivity, corporate influence, and the sometimes ambiguous themes it promotes. The reality is far from a secretive gathering of conspirators, but rather a highly publicized event that raises questions about transparency and accountability. Don't forget to subscribe for more insightful content. And as always, thank you for watching. Until next time, take care.